with Viewpoint. Waiting to the right of me is Judith K. Busby, the co-host of Viewpoint, the politicians, perspectives, and personalities. Very you got all your three P's in a row. The three P's? Is that alliteration of what? <laughs> you did I don't well, any. we missed all of our friends out in listener land last Wednesday. I certainly hope yes, where were that you? they missed us. <laughs> where were you out there? We were here, but nobody nobody was called in. <laughs> oh, piffle. <laughs> <laughs> well, been a character builder all winter, hasn't it? Yes, uh, it has. Yes, it has. But it's been kind of nice. You know, I had occasion over the weekend to go up to northern Minnesota and it was so beautiful. All the meadows and the trees were laden with this virginal snow. The only thing you'd see were deer tracks through it and and then of course the snowmobile tracks. Everybody north has at least one machine and they run them. Boy, <laughs> They have a good time with them, but they, they do kind of mess up the pretty Share snow. with us what the temperature was when you left yesterday morning. 25 below. I thought it was pretty tough here, 11 below. And yeah. it was. It was 25 below up up near Aiken, Minnesota. Okay, kudos. We don't want to forget the kudos here at Viewpoint. No. Uh, I guess we would really confine the kudos this morning to the volunteers and, more especially, the patrons. Uh, who worked so hard and, and enjoyed the uh, flight, uh, honor flight uh, breakfast uh, last uh, uh, Sunday morning out at the Legion. They had a huge crowd, Judy, big crowd, and had a lot of volunteers. And you know, things like that don't uh, don't come off without a lot of people helping. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons we have our guests here today for the same uh, modus operandi. So, uh, uh, kudos to those folks who are out there. And uh, um, are you prepared to, to introduce our guest at this point in time? Let's bring him aboard because uh, we're talking about volunteers and we've got two great ones right here. And they, they are. You know, s somehow I think always that women are the ones who do the volunteering. And I'm so wrong. <laughs> Once again, I'm wrong. It's so nice to have you with us. Tom Martin, Phil Bertoni. They're both from Mount Pulaski. They both have been from Mount Pulaski like their whole lives, right? Except well, I still went away to... The, to uh, sir, sir. Yeah, I was in the Navy out in California and got married and raised my family and taught school for 40, 40 years out there. So I just came back. Came back to his roots. 11 years ago to my, to my hometown. And my wife is a Californian girl, but she enjoyed coming back because she thought it would be a good place to retire and uh, from the hubbub of LA. LA is real tough to to get around in. It's the traffic and all. How does she like rush hour in Mount Pulaski? She, what's that? How does she like rush hour in Mount uh, Pulaski? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. Uh, she got into an accident just the first year we were there because she didn't realize that going uptown on the square um, people are pulling in and out all the time and she drove too close I guess to to those parked cars that are angled in uh -huh. and it was not her fault but yet she doesn't realize that you try to hug the center as you go because people when they're pulling out they in Pulaski anyway they don't always uh, look too carefully that's vinegar here. And, uh, <laughs> so then she said Phil what did I do wrong I said you didn't do anything wrong but and of course she didn't but yet i told her that from now on try to hug the center of that street more for those of you who have not been to Pulaski recently they still park in the middle of the street over there yeah <laughs> they, they do and that's one that's reason she might hood. not have hugged the center that day i don't know because there were people there too yeah. uh, let let me ask you if i dare uh vinegar hill i know it's always vinegar hill what in the world is the vinegar hill business well um, I, you know, I had a, a friend of mine uh, whose uncle was in the liquor business in around 1900, 1910, 1920s on up to, and that liquor business is one of our museums. Uh, we have two, we have two uh, storefronts, two buildings that uh -huh. are the Mont Pulaski Historical Museum. One used to be the First National Bank, and one was this, this tavern. It was called the Romer's Tavern. And he told me, he says, Phil, he says, uh, my uncles told me that the high school boys were on the payroll to help lug the 
the vinegar barrels full of contraband whiskey and beer onto the trains at our, at our depot that went to Lincoln and Springfield and, 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 so, and Decatur. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. He says, they were on the payroll because those, those things were heavy. And high school kids enjoyed making some little extra money. Sure. And so during the Depression, um, or the Prohibition. Prohibition, yeah. Um, Mount Pulaski was the last town in uh, all of central Illinois that went dry. And the local constables and all that went along with it because they liked to have a few drinks too, you know. <laughs> so no one, no one bought, and we had moonshiners all over the place making stuff in their bathtubs and they had the little steels and, and then they would sell it to the local taverns who would sell it to the people. Well, they got to be so good at it, they, they started packaging it and putting it in these barrels that were marked with uh, pickles. Oh, See, vinegar, sure. pickles. And so when these barrels showed up in Decatur, they thought there were pickles and vinegar in there, but there was really booze. <laughs> so that's why we became known as Vinegar Hill. Oh, upon my word. Now you know. I bet they wondered why people were so into pickles all of a sudden, yeah. didn't they? <laughs> so the conductor then, when he would come to Ma Pulaski on the train, his code word for getting off, he would say, all out for Vinegar Hill. And the people that had their flasks and bottles to load up with booze, that was their signal, Vinegar Hill, because they didn't know Mount Pulaski from anything, but they knew the word Vinegar Hill meant something to them. See. No, it's a great, it's a great uh, story, yeah. Yeah. legend down through the years, mm -hmm. and it's great to have it called still uh, Vinegar Hill. Can, can we go back even farther? How did they choose? Casimir Pulaski to name their okay, town this after. This is one of my. I, I got Tom Martin here. I'm asking him to. <laughs> he's the history man. I, I think he's interested. I'm too, asking though. him to. <laughs> well, I'm. I'm looking for him for nods and for, because he's helping me, although in a silent way here to make sure I get everything covered. Uh, but. Uh, the, the, the founders of our town. There were three founders. Uh, Jabez Capps and Dr. Barton Robinson were from London, England, and he, Barton Robinson, got his medical degree in London, and but thought he could do better in America, getting jobs to for patients, you know, and become a doctor. And his brother wanted to move too, so they picked up, moved to the Springfield area. He and his brother, and uh, Jabez was a, from a family of ten, the oldest. And his father was a clothier. In those days, they called him clothiers. He was a tailor, but as well as he, he got uh, uh, linens and, and cloths from the Orient and all that, and then they would uh, make them into clothing, you know. So he was more than a tailor. He would, he would start from scratch. Right. And he had a big business with the Parliament in England. Uh, they were located in Westminster. So his son, Jabez, knew that he wasn't going to be able to get in that business because he was the oldest and his father was going great guns and there was no room for him in the business. So he took off for America and ended up in Springfield and got married. He was a teacher and, a, and he got into post, he was a postmaster there and different things. He got to know Abraham Lincoln and used Abraham Lincoln as a lawyer in some of his dealings with uh, real estate. Because he was a wheel and a dealer. He was a merchant. and Stay with us. Bob Pulaski's coming in. <laughs> yeah. So then they found out about this hill, and they t inspected it and realized that this would be a good place for a town because every time it rains, it's not like Springfield is full of mosquitoes and mud. <laughs> and until Lake Springfield came along, that's why you call it Springfield, the spring and all that. And it was just muddy, murky mosquito-ridden place. I Sorry for Mont Plasky, or for Springfield listeners. Yeah, yeah they it, won't give you a job as, as yeah. their spokesman, but it, I don't it, think. But, but Mont Pulaski was pristine uh, in comparison with uh, Springfield, although Springfield was more located on the train, you know, the railroad tracks and all that stuff, although the tracks weren't laid yet, but they, you know, it was between Chicago and, and St. Louis, and it was a, a, a trail place that people... But Plasky was off the trail, but yet it was a better f farming community. They, they could see the advantages of this place on the, on the hill. 
And so they decided, let's take a chance. And so we got, G Caps was the merchant. Robinson was the doctor and did veterinarian work. And then the third guy was the guy that owned all the land around there. His name uh, uh, was Turley. Oh. Turley from Lake Fork area owned the land. And um, so they talked him into to setting up uh, plots of land to sell them to uh, people to buy for their homes and for their businesses. Mm -hmm. Tracts of land, you know. He, they talked him into doing that, and he kind of him and hawed. And he said, well, you know, if I'm going to do this, now I, I've gotten this information from one of his descendants who is a, um, a professional... Uh, genealogist? Uh, you, huh? Genealogist? Yeah, genealogist, I guess you'd call it. But there's another name for it. But anyway, um, and she's told me that, that he, this Turley guy said that, well, if I'm going to do what you want me to do, and I know I'm going to make some money from this, but... I'm partnering with all this Turley land that my father and us uh, have acquired over all of the years. I, he said, okay, but I want to name the town. So his father fought in the Revolutionary War, mm -hmm. and he fought with George Washington, <clears throat> and one of the battles was Brandywine Creek near Philadelphia, where well, the British defeated them, and they were running back to Philadelphia with their tails between their legs, a defeated army. And the British were picking them off uh, one by one as they, you know, they were just decimating Washington's army. And this Kashmir Pulaski and his cavalry just came over from Poland and had met Benjamin Franklin in uh, Paris and got a letter of recommendation. And so they, on their, they came to Philadelphia to try to get a, a place in the war and they kind of laughed at him. Mm -hmm. But they heard this boom, boom, boom in the distance and they went out to figure out what was going on they could see what was going on real quick they could see that the redcoats were chasing the the ragtag american colonists and they knew which side was which real quick and so they took their horses and their you know their swords and all that and they intervened and of course if you've got a 1500 pound horse coming down at you you don't need a musket or in those days they had single shot muskets mm -hmm. you don't need that you just so they just ran oh, over them and the, so the British went in retreat. Well, the Turley father was saved that day, saved his life. And so he told his son the story. And so his son never forgot Casimir Pulaski. And that's why it's named Pulaski. Now, there, you I just heard, you've just heard the longest answer to a direct <laughs> question that one will ever hear. And, and I want to say for the record, Phil was not a history teacher. He was a math teacher. <laughs> he probably knows the history. Well, but I'm going to correct you. I started out as a history teacher. Oh, there, uh, I knew there had to be in there somewhere. <laughs> that, that well, has, I always I, wondered why they they chose a, a Polish soldier. Well, of okay. Fortune. And the, no. well, you know, the other part of the fine. story, the reason the British went, uh, the, these uh, Caps and Barton went along with it, that they realized that the Germans were going to come in and populate the town. It was all, this whole area, Central Illinois, is mostly Germans yep. coming in. And we've got families in Pulaski uh, that Tom and I know. They're from the same town, Wurt Württemberg, Germany. Mm -hmm. And we're talking, and we're, you know, the Bookers and the, and uh, we could just go on and on and talk about the German families. Uh, so they knew that a like naming it Yorktown or some British name would not stick, you know, because a lot of times these towns change their name after a while. Oh yeah. So they, <coughs> like Bloomingdale, you know, that doesn't exist anymore. So, and that was just up northern. So anyway, that's they they like that too. Actually, we're gathered here this morning, really. You know, Judy and I have this this strong feeling about some of our little small communities right up here in Atlanta, Jim's hometown, and uh, Emden, and, and uh, you know, you go down to Elkhart and Pulaski, and each and every one of these little communities, uh, with the exception of Burton View, uh, <laughs> has a small cadre of people who really enjoy working on behalf of their communities, volunteerism, and that's really kind of what we're going to hone in on. Uh, I don't know whether Mr. Ash is uh, ready for the commercials at this point in time, and if he is, uh, we'll go ahead and take a break, and then we're going to get back, and we're going to talk about volunteerism on Vinegar Hill. 
<laughs> well, we're right back here in the studios live, and uh, the program is uh, Viewpoint. This morning we have a couple of gentlemen uh, who are typical of uh, what goes on in our small communities in Golden County in helping them get things done. There's been a lot going on in Mount Pulaski. Uh, Tom Martin, you've been uh, in the focal point of a lot of it. Uh, you and a lot of other helpful people, and I know you'd be the first to point that out. Uh, Tom and I, by the way, go back a lot. I remember when he was just first born. <laughs> Is and that he, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, you, we have a we have an affinity for that family. I can go back a long way. But anyway, uh, it's been a source of pride to me because I knew his father and his grandfather so well uh, to see Tom so involved uh, in helping what's going on in Pulaski. Uh, gentlemen, kind of take it from the top, if you will. What have we, what have we been doing over there? I remember, of course, your big, uh, your big centennial celebration. Uh, no, it wasn't your centennial. 175th yeah, celebration. Yeah, 175th, yeah. Uh, that was a big deal over there. But there's a lot of things going on over you. You know, you banded together, you've got that wonderful courthouse, and uh, there's a foundation for that. And uh, there's just a lot of things going on to keep people involved in Mount Pulaski and Vinegar Hill. Yeah, you know, we're like every other little town, and big towns too. Your volunteers create and, and make the town hum and purr along. I mean, you have your government and you have your schools and businesses but in every aspect every town really depends on a lot of volunteer oh, labor we, to get things done oh yeah. man we can't all be the chief we've got to have right. some indians <laughs> and everybody finds their place usually yes. you know it's uh it's what i've learned in church that you have a, uh, a, a gift given to you and you use those gifts whether it be money whether it be talents somehow you give back to your community and i think most of us have been raised up that way that uh, part of what makes us tick part of what makes us enjoy life is giving back many, some of the many blessings that we've been given um you know i can speak to the foundation real quickly that's what i'm involved in right now mm -hmm. it's the mount plassey courthouse foundation and um it's the legacy project we decided in when we had our 175th celebration that we wanted to have a legacy project that continued on mm -hmm. so that when once the 175th was over it wasn't just history it wasn't just in the record books mm -hmm. and um, we came up with the idea that um, as we all well know the state of Illinois is in has difficult times right now you know I financially it. yeah I read it in the paper. and um, I think our community because of the courthouse and this the courthouse is owned by the state kept looking to Springfield to do some of the repairs and take care of it and a lot of that wasn't being able to be accomplished mm -hmm. sure. and so our community said and our our committee at that time said you know this facility this courthouse was much longer a school uh, jail uh, part of our community longer than it was where Abraham Lincoln served as a lawyer and even though that's the historical significance to it that's been a center of our community for a, a long time ever since it was built so we decided that we needed to take upon ourselves to take care of uh, the building it was our responsibility and hopefully someday the state will get its feet back on the ground and they can help us out a little bit more but right now we consider it as our responsibility to take care of the courthouse ourselves on behalf of our community and on behalf of the whole world and the history that uh, and, and we so we so what we did was establish a foundation We've raised approximately $85,000 up to this point. Um, the Illinois Historic Preservation Agency is a big part of that. We, we work with them to determine what needs to be done. We're still underneath their guidance, but um, what we like to consider ourselves, we're the boots on the ground. Uh -huh. We're the ones who can really take a look what needs to be done, bring them in and say, you know, we've raised money. Um, we'd like to repair three or four of the windows. We'd like to update the electrical um service in the building um we've replaced steps we've replaced doors we're trying to take on some of the things that will keep the integrity of the building whole so it doesn't deteriorate and um any major project we think that you know the state and ihpa will come in and help us on but right now we're trying to just maintain that building um so it doesn't deteriorate any longer and, and what we try to do is make the the courthouse the center of the community again try and more get involved it's not just a historic site where visitors come and I think a lot of people got used to 
just driving by and they weren't seen any longer. Mm -hmm. So what we've tried to do is involve it in the community, get involved with the schools and the children again, which has been a mm -hmm. huge positive for us. The, the schools, um, and I don't know, last year we had a third grade class help raise money. They raised almost $20,000 for us and are still sure. raising money for yeah. us. Good. So that yeah, really amazing. jump started us and got us uh, a lot of PR and yes. a, that we could never have, we could have sat in meetings forever and not come up with a PR program like what they did for us. So Yeah, they, they did a good job for you. <laughs> right, right. What they did was they kind of, they got the idea out there and, and they, they struck a chord with a lot of people that if the kids are able to recognize how important this facility is and are willing to go out and spend their time to raise monies, the adults all kind of sat back and looked at one another and said, you know, maybe this is a project that's worthwhile. We've kind of ignored it. And the kids, we they did interviews uh, from people around the world and in Indiana and Ohio and Iowa. And everybody really jumped on this story. And it was it was really good for us because it, it kind of helped us get the community more involved much more quickly than what we expected it to happen. They certainly you know, brought to the fore a little that, child shall lead them, didn't right. they? Right. There's a spinoff to that. And it is these youngsters at that age have learned something about right putting something back into the community. There's no doubt. Right. It's See, priceless. That's, right. that's, right. that's a great lesson for these kids. Yeah. Right. They, they were an integral part of that. Right, right. And they took that on. They looked around the community and said, you know, we can be part of that. We want to be able to bring our children back here and said that we were part of this and we helped save the courthouse. So you're exactly right. Are there other courthouses mm -hmm. that, that were actually a building where Lincoln worked? here in central yeah. Illinois. Well, there's the one at the old courthouse in Springfield. Well, there's, only, but there's only two on the original uh, places at Metamora and Mount Pulaski on the 8th Judicial Circuit, which it, at his time was 15 county seats. Yes. Now, Taylorville has one, but it's, it's been moved several times, so they don't count that as... But it's original log cabin, two-story facility. I've been down there and I've seen it. But it's not as prestigious as the Mount Pulaski brick one or the Metamora, of course. And then Decatur has one, but it's been moved around a couple times. And again, it's a wooden structure. That mm -hmm. so, so then they say there's only two that exist on the original, and that, that, that's true. Mm -hmm. But then don't forget, there's Beardstown, and there's Springfield, and there's all these other places, Charleston, that has, have original courthouses that Abraham Lincoln practiced law on. So we're just talking about the Ace Judicial Circuit. There's only two that exist on the original spots, mm -hmm. uh, and, and they're open f daily for visitation, state historic sites. Mm -hmm. You know, when you stop to think about the circuit rider, as we call him, that was a significant undertaking. For 450 people. miles in the spring and 450 miles in the fall, six weeks uh, in the spring and six weeks in the fall. I just finished Guy Fraker's book, and uh, he, another fraternity his, brother, his, with your brother, with your dad, I mean, yeah. His uh, his take on it was that Lincoln enjoyed being on the circuit, large as it was and long lasting as the trip was, mm -hmm. uh, much more than most of the others did. Well, one reason, uh, he just loved to read so much that it gave him an opportunity to, to read and to talk to people and to get information about everything, whereas the other guys were more into doing their job and in getting back to their families. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, Lincoln had a family, but he was really into improving himself i mean he wasn't educated like the rest of these guys were no. so he was still learning and he became um what he what became on the on the circuit he became a learned man he read shakespeare and he read mm -hmm. uh, you know he just and then he he, he just loved uh in, in talking to people and he became the center of attraction they he was sort of the court gesture in a way, he, stories. But then when he got to Pulaski, he was slipped down into a couple of homes of people he knew from Springfield that moved to Pulaski. One was this Javis Capps, the founder. Mm -hmm. Another was this Lushball guy, Thomas Lushball. Uh, and their homes were more comfortable and the food was better than the hotel. <laughs> that's that's one of the things the that the book pointed out pretty dramatically. Yeah. <laughs> Nasty food. Right. Yeah. 
You know, speaking of, of, of learning, uh, last night I was privileged to go down to Springfield and hear, hear Dr. Ben Carson. Uh, came from extremely poverty-stricken circumstances. His mother couldn't read, but she made those two boys, he and his brother, read books and write reports that she couldn't read. Mm -hmm. But they didn't know that. And that, that's the beginning, the humble beginnings of where that man is today, a noted neurosurgeon and so forth. But uh, the point is learning and starting at that age. And that's exactly, uh, and as you suggest, Lincoln was determined to improve himself and, and became a man of, of letters by reading. Uh, Tom, more specifically, if um, somebody wanted to uh, uh, leave some money to the foundation, uh, there, and by the way, uh, there are families who may not have uh, heirs as such and might uh, want to uh, help communities. Um, and by the way, that's not a bad idea for people who have no direct heirs and descendants and so forth. Uh, how would they go about uh, uh, contributing to the Mount Pulaski Court Arts Foundation? Yeah, well, you just happen to have a brochure. Uh, yeah, fortunately, Phil was on the, on the spot again with that. Um, <coughs> we're like I said, we're called the Mount Pulaski Court Arts Foundation, and you can reach us at P.O. Box 171, Mount Pulaski, Illinois, 62548. And I would think the best thing they'd want to do, because they probably don't know a lot about us, is to contact us, contact mm -hmm. myself or one of our board members, and um, talk to us about it, and, and really see who we are and what we're trying to achieve. I, I think the best thing we can do is try and educate people on, on what our mission is, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then if they feel comfortable and they feel like that's something that would that would dovetail with what they'd like to do, then, you know, we'd be more than happy to, to talk with them and work with them on that. You mentioned that you were still tied in your whole volunteer group with the, the state's yes. department and that they give you guidance. Now, yes. with that guidance, do they say, and if you want a little money, you'll do it my way? What I tell you, I have found them really easy to get along with. They know, they understand that we're, like I said before, the boots on the ground and that we've Correct. raised this awareness of the courthouse. And so what they have been, um, worked with us very well. When we come to say, here's what we'd like to do, they just say, just run it by us. And a lot of the small things like the windows and the doors and the electric, they just want to make sure that it, it, the integrity of the building is maintained mm -hmm. from the historical right. perspective. Historically, yeah. And as long as we're doing that, they'll come in and give us some maybe some technical advice, but they'll let us use volunteers. They'll let us do the work and raise the money to do that. I think when, when they really need to be involved is when if, if, the, if the roof needed replacing, if there's a lot of work on the inside and the outside walls that um, need to be worked that we don't have the capability of, of doing, that they come in and really write the project up and come in and, and um, help give us the guidelines how it should be done. But they've been very, um, very good with sitting down with us at the table and allowing us to do a lot of the things as long as it maintains integrity, the historical integrity. Volunteerism is one of the things I like best about the world too, Tom. Uh, how many volunteers do you have on your Well, community? you know, that's one of our major projects this year. <laughs> We've got a board uh, up to 11 people. We have nine on our board right now. Um, but one thing we have faced, this has taken off to such a large degree faster than what we thought it <laughs> was. We have about four or five events a year, but there's so many things nine people aren't able to do from the standpoint of fundraising, um, working with volunteers. And there's so many things we can be doing that one of our goals at our annual meeting in January was to establish that network of up to maybe 200 volunteers that we're going to reach out to. Um, and so we can reach out to them and say, you know, we need three or four hours of your time at an upcoming event. Um, it can all fall back to the board members, which it has been lately. And one thing I don't want to do, and we all understand what happens, is that you can burn people out very quickly. Yeah. And so what we're trying to do is spread the load out. We have so much support right now from the community, but what we need to do is have them also give a little bit of their time to help us do some of the things we need to be, need to have done. Right. I'd like to add, uh, Tom, that um, every year for the last 25 years or so, they have a prom walk out of the front door of the courthouse, the junior and senior prom mm -hmm. kids. Um, and it is, it is, well, I know Lincoln has something similar now, yeah. but yeah. This is unbelievable. When I moved back to Pulaski, I did, I, this was something I uh, got to, to enjoy that I never knew took place. 
except I'd see it in our local paper when I got it in California. But I, but then uh, Phyllis Beckhue, who b belongs to your board, has come up with the idea, as uh, she told me just the other day, that we're going to push this idea of, uh, at least it's her idea, of trying to get wedding parties up there more often. Now, they do go up there once in a while to take pictures mm -hmm. in front of the courthouse, you know, the wedding party. But to advertise it more and maybe somehow set up a, a place where they can have a little reception, um, it's, it's sort of cramped quarters inside, but there, we could do it maybe. It's hard to get the older folks of the families up those steps maybe, but uh, maybe we uh, could figure out how to, to get a, a, a ramp set up so they could get up there a little better at that time well, for the even, older folks. Even if they came there to that lovely site, and had a tent put up. A lot of people have a tent put up for a reception. Then they could have their reception in the tent. Be kind of hard in the building because yeah. it's rooms. Right, so it confined. You know, two confined. It goes yeah. back to again us trying to make that the courthouse and the square the center of our community again, and people knowing they can utilize the building and knowing they can use the grounds, and not it's not just a sacred spot yeah. for visitors come. We want to be a, a vibrant part of our community, and that's just one of the ways we want to try and do that. Well, one of the things you do, you have these nice uh, lawn concerts yes, for right. the people, right. and they're very nice. We and Gene and I come over there. We it's a new bandstand, and we oh, yes, it's, a, a great it's the third stand. one. It's They've had bandstands in that courthouse lawn for over a hundred years, and this is the third one now. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ma plasky has been noted for its brass bands back in the Abraham Lincoln era, where the, the German in, immigrants, they brought their instruments and music with them, and bless them, they've given us, our community, our music. And we have been tops in our music program mm -hmm. yes. for uh, uh, ever since the 1880s. Uh, I, we know the band instructors' names. We've got it all written down. We've got pictures of bands, uh, not just high school bands, but... Uh, adult bands after they get out of high school they form these adult bands and go around and play play for for shindigs and it's gone on and on and on and they're still doing it we still have a local band don't you mm -hmm. it's not just brass now but you branched out yeah it's <laughs> branched out the uh, the work that it takes to put these things together somebody had to sit and start it and uh, uh, young Mr. Martin, uh, he came. He comes by his volunteerism uh, very naturally. Uh, his grandfather, Harry J. Weibel, publisher of the Mount Plasky Times News, was a great mover. And not a, and he, he he just did it in a quiet way. Uh, great supporter of what went on in Mount Plasky, and used his paper to that end. And so Tom's volunteerism comes that way. And uh, it comes naturally with him. And happily, that kind of rubbed off a little bit. Well, I was very fortunate to have, you know, a lot of family who, who yes. knew that giving back was, was important. And, you know, we've tried to pass that along to our family and our children. But what you learn early on is one person can make a difference. And it, mm -hmm. and I know it's kind of cliche to say that. It's but still true. It's still true, and it does make a difference. And people, you don't, people need someone sometimes just to light the fire. And I've learned that, and um, we have many people in our community that do that in their own way in, in other areas. And so you, we're just one piece of the puzzle. I mean, a community is made up of a lot of different entities, a lot of different pieces and parts. And we're just one part of that right now. But our business community, our churches, our schools, all the other organizations, what we try and do is work together and work in unison to make your community a better place to live. And, and um, I think that we've been blessed to be in a community that there's a lot of a lot of people who were willing to do that and it's made our community a, uh, a very special place yeah, and there was a prodigious amount of work that went into the 175th celebration yeah you, we started you, you had a great that uh, the, the the volunteer base stretched right. out a lot right you know we we were fortunate that um we started it early on in 2010 two years before and uh, i know my wife will tell you that i came here one night and said i think i want to be part of the Celebration. He goes, well, what celebration is that? And I told her, and, and she just kind of smiled because she's used to that going on. But, <laughs> you know, once I reached out to the community and we started having meetings, the first meeting we had about 30 people there, which is somewhat unique for a first meeting, and that gradually grew to over 100 people. 
And what we did, we got the whole town organized and behind it, and it just took off like wildfire. And fire. You know, at one of the meetings, Tom says, you know, somebody asked him, well, how much money do you think this is all going to take? And Tom had already figured, did some figuring. He says, well, I think we're going to have to read a, raise about 100000 And we all about fell off our <laughs> chairs. <laughs> and guess what? We raised 105000 right? And right. so the, the extra 5000 that he calculated uh, that we didn't need sure enough we paid all our bills hundred thousand dollars that five thousand went to the courthouse, courthouse. foundation right, right. perfect right. perfect so use of that we stayed on budget which is somewhat unique also but that I, is. Know, I know some politicians that ought to come talk to you <laughs> really? So staying on, really? Yeah, staying I won't on give budget. out my number on that because yeah, right. so, uh, we put out your phone number yeah, on the air so. so we can get them to come to right. Springfield or to <laughs> Mount Pulaski from Springfield yeah. But when it's a grassroots thing, it is. you feel such a responsibility because this, this guy who, who contributed to the cause is your next door neighbor right. and the guy you see at the grocery store every day. And uh, I, I think it, it makes you want to be awfully responsible. Right. <laughs> and we're all in, you know, we look at uh, our, our little cities, but then we are part of the county. And every, every time somebody in Lincoln or Atlanta... New Holland, Elkhart, Chestnut, anywhere in our, you're proud of what they're doing. You yes. want, you, you're, you're happy for them, but also makes our whole area a better place to live. And so we're all in it together. And then, you know, it spreads out from there. But I mean, I know our county struggles occasionally, but if you take a look at our communities and the people who are there, we really do a fantastic job in maintaining our identity. And I think that's exactly what Judy and I were trying to point out when we invited these two gentlemen to here today is it's it, it's the beauty of living in a small community and there's a lot to be said for that you may have to drive a little further for your bread and milk or, or, or shoes or whatever but the, there's a core living in a small community which makes life a lot a lot better well it's where we all came from most of us and you don't yeah. want to forget that because it's such a it's it's who we are and i think that as time goes on that's going to become as more and more important I mean, there's so many opportunities there for our, our folks to move on and and become part of the world population, but it's still where you came from and your roots. And, and, we, and for those of us who are still here, I think it's our responsibility to maintain that. Well, that's true in your, uh, your sister city at the other end of the Mount Pulaski Elkhart Blacktop. Uh, Elkhart is doing the same thing, and, and, and right up here just over my right shoulder in Atlanta, uh, those folks now, they're working on the, on the uh, library. And we're mm -hmm. going to get Bill Thomas to come in here and talk about that. We had, to, we had to scrub Bill's mission last week. For some reason, we couldn't get into the studio. I'm not sure why. I think Jim yeah. was a wimp, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Bill, uh, w people don't have to walk very far to get milk in our town. we got three places you can buy groceries now. We've got our grocery store that's been there for years and years and years. Yeah. Well, we've always had a grocery store. Sure. Sometimes yeah. we've had two or three. You know, we used to have a Kroger's grocery store yeah. back oh, yeah. in the old days when I grew up. But now we've got a new Casey's uh, convenience store and gas station. Yeah, saw that. And uh, so we, we are self-sufficient. We have our own dentists. And the mm -hmm. first time I ever remember, we've, ever, we've never had a doctor on, on staff. But we've always had a doctor mm -hmm. for in, until about three years ago, three or four years ago. But now we do have a medical we have a medical facility there out of Springfield, the Springfield Clinic, SIU Clinic, that's there now several days a week. So we're back on track with our medical uh, services, too. Great. Well, the time clock did it again to us, Judith Kay. Uh, we always try to close viewpoint with a uh, comment or two or something that I've dug up from somewhere. Uh, this one kind of smacks a little, a little of politics, but, but the important part of it is getting the message here, and it says, uh, uh, by the way, this was one of your favorites, Lieutenant Colonel Allen West. Uh, so, <laughs> Phil and I, you know, as, as, as uh, Dr. Carson said, you may disagree with him politically, but always respect him. Phil and I have great respect for one another, so I like to put the needle once in a while. <laughs> anyway, uh, Allen West said, our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardmen, volunteer, protect and defend this country and all its citizens, and do so with the sure knowledge and the same integrity that our nation continues asking them to do more and more 
and unfortunately with less and less. And by the way, I just want to, at uh, that context, I'd want to mention the uh, Wounded Warriors Project. It's a great project, folks. Think about it. Thank you for Viewpoint. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.